Hello, yeah, we are the apps and practices group and, um, well, don't touch it, Let, well, how to, yeah. So uh, very briefly, um, we started off like, okay, the, the web uh, yes, was initially considered as an informational space, uh, social media as a space for user-generated content and connectedness, and kind of the leading question uh, across uh, the multiple uh, subgroups was, okay, what type of space is the app space? Um, so, sorry. Yeah, we have, uh, so I have a brief uh, introduction actually because uh, we are with four subgroups, so lots to say and show. Very little time, so I immediately. So hello everyone. Uh, Gabriel and I, uh, we belong to, uh, we have a similar, we belong to different groups where we have a similar research and we s use the same method. So what we looked at was uh, beautification apps, uh, like my group and his group looked at like body modifications. So what we did, we searched for different search queries. You can see them over here on the screen in different languages and um, his group looked at uh, body filter. And we selected um, a number of apps and then we uh, scraped like all the screenshots and those we analyzed and uh, categorized. Um, and uh, so as I was saying, our group was looking at the phase and we looked at three different countries. So we looked at Brazil, India and the United States. And what we found was that uh, when it comes to uh, the um, the face modifications that there were social differences, for example, like in India and in Brazil, like the skin toning was way more uh, relevant um, than in the United States, for example. Um, but also, uh, like one of our findings was that most of these uh, modifications were uh, targeted at women, like there was only one picture which was like relating to men. And uh, another interesting thing we found was like how these apps enable amateurs to edit their photos like easily on their phone, whereas uh, back in the day it needed like professionals. And now um, Gabriel will tell you something about the bodies. Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. Well, so we use a similar method for the body. Uh, the difference was that we crop all the preview, the image preview, the screenshot according to the part of the body that was uh, offered to be enhanced. And uh, also for the body analysis, we found that uh, most of these apps are uh, addressed to women and also to a specific, that they offer you to uh, look like a specific type of woman, which is a woman with a very uh, small waist and very long legs as you can see, specifically in Brazil and in the US. Uh, whereas in India, with the Indian query, we found a very, very different uh, um, you know, landscape. Um, and so it, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, that is mainly addressed to men, and uh, I would say also very lazy men, because as you can see there, uh, instead of uh, announcement, uh, there is uh, like the kind of things that are offered is a full body replacement so you can just stick your face <laughs> on a very uh, uh, fit body and that's our most important finding. And uh, for future research we also uh, had in mind that it would be interesting for people to look at like what what people are doing with those edited images like do they use it for advertisement or just to post it on social media or is it just to uh, like try out the features yeah, for fun exactly. So, yes. All right, so our uh, group looked at a similar, well, not similar, but similar project to theirs. Uh, we decided to look at the portrayal of gender, um, of gender representation in the health and fitness applications in both the iOS and Play Store. Um, how we did that, um, we coded a lot. Uh, we used uh, different tools to scrape information from both the iOS and Play Store and subsequently um, manually coded um, the practices of the application um, and looking at specifically at targeted genders 
uh, subscription prices, which is really prominent in the uh, iOS store, uh, the practices of the applications, as I said before, and the icons. However, because it is such a large data set and we only have three minutes to present, we decided to not uh, include the subscription price and the icons in our findings that we're presenting to you. Um, right, so this is the overall matrix that we, um, that we, uh, yeah, kind of took out from all the data that we coded. Um, in the first, um, in this part, you can see um, the uh, first top five categories are mainly related um, to either community or, uh, yeah, community um, apps, app practices or uh, workout or activity app practices um, instead of maybe being looking at mental health, meditation, which is more down, um, down on the matrix, which means it's less prominent. What is interesting in regards to gender is that in these top five categories, the gender is generally well distributed among those five categories, whereas later on that is not, uh, no longer the case. Um, so per country, since we also looked at 10 different countries, what we found is that UK um, has the most uh, gender neutral health and fitness apps across the 10 countries that we coded for. Um, they had 88% of their apps um, uh, and their practices uh, belong to the, uh, to the NA not applicable or not available category. Um, the other, another founding, finding that we found is that um, Mexico had the highest amount of uh, female-related applications um, and female-related um, um, app practices. Uh, they had, I think, 43% of their applications, of their top 20 applications, were, had something to do with the female body um, or female health. Uh, and for men, which is why we're not presenting it, um, men were overall, there was no more than 5% of uh, the applications were directed towards men in any of the countries. So as you can see, you know, men are quite disregarded in the health and fitness uh, application stores. And uh, oh, for further research, I guess we could use all the other stuff that we coded for. <laughs> Okay, so my group focused on um, comparing the App Store in two different countries. Um, the research question was, what different privacy apps are shown by comparing Google App Store results based on language, country, or query variables for the United States and Iran? Uh, because we thought they were very different countries in terms of like privacy and uh, regulation and the law and stuff. Uh, second question related to that is uh, where are the app developers located um, for these apps and how is it different between Iran and the US? So the method was to look at the top 15 apps for it three different search queries, privacy, security, and protection. Um, and we put those in English and in Farsi, uh, Farsi for the Iran store and in English for the US store. And we also use the search, the uh, URL parameters um, in the stores to ch change the country and the language settings. Thanks. So this combines both of the questions I mentioned into one visualization. Um, in the middle, you can see Iran and the US. And on the left, your left, you can see the developer of the app. And on the right, the category which we put the app into. So. In Iran, a lot of the developers were not supplied, were not specified. Whereas in the US, you can see that it's more, you get uh, 
more information, and most of them are based in the US, or many of them. Um, thanks. Uh, so the, the findings were that there was a difference between the Iranian Farsi search results and the US English search results. Um, in the Iranian results, they showed more personal privacy tools like app locks. So the top one there is an, a logo from the app, app lock or private photo galleries. And then uh, in the US results, it was more property protection as how you could categorize it as antiviruses or data protection apps like uh, this uh, duck, duck go or like a privacy checkup tool. Uh, and the developer location, like I said, in the Iranian results, they were not provided, whereas in the US, they're more specific about providing it. Right, so we're the fourth and last subgroup, so we're going to make it a bit quick. So um, our group, we looked at the higher. We looked at whether, um, or we wanted to examine if and how the infrastructure behind apps uh, accompanying uh, fitness trackers, such as uh, Fitbit, um, how they connect to third-party software. Um, so a bit more formalized, this is the research question, how do companion mobile apps manage the infrastructure of this intimate and very you know, private and personal uh, data that these fitness trackers collect? So let me talk you through both this visualization and the methodology we used to answer this question. So in the middle you see the uh, 12 CMAs we collected, so the companion apps, and to the left of them you see the permissions that users need to... Um, or they are requested to accept when they're installing these apps. And on the right, you can see um, uh, we uh, scraped the software development kits that were used in the uh, development of these apps. So um, what you can take away from this is that on the front end, the permissions used across these 12 companion apps are quite similar, actually. So there's a similarity in which permissions um, users need to accept before they can use their uh, tracking device. And the same we can say for the uh, SDKs. So these SDKs, they include um, things such as social logins, so connections to Facebook, but also the support libraries that developers use to quickly um, develop their applications. And also, they include advertisement libraries. But we only found four cases of them three of which were used by MyFit. So um, that made us realize that actually the more important or the more interested, uh, interesting part is actually the, the ecosystem that are embedded within these companion apps. So these companion apps themselves are actually um, also included or include these different sort of uh, ecosystems, which I will show you now. So what you're looking at here, this blue jellyfish, is um, actually uh, our case study we further analyzed, which is Fitbit, and the uh, sensors it uses, um, uh, and the permissions that are specific for um, this tracker. So this means that um, this environment allows third parties to develop apps specifically for the tracker. So in other words, these uh, third parties have access to all this private data. And what we try to do here is to map how and where that data can flow. So you have first a wearable, then we move to the sensors, and then the different forms of permissions that the users need to accept, um, or the developers, um, and then that leads to specific development areas, APIs, where these uh, third parties can actually access um, the data within the Fitbit. Um, and we then specify that whether or not that permission and that API was for the device, so the device on your, um, your wrist, or actually the companion app that was close to it.
So in the last step, we looked at what kind of apps have then been built for Fitbit. So what we found is that there's an app store within your Fitbit, basically. So building on the previous mapping exercise, we looked into this emerging space of wearable specific app stores. So Fitbit has its own app store, the app gallery, which has very few categories and only 519 apps, which then made it possible to manually code them for practices. So what is specific to this Fitbit space can be read from the practices they support. So they're extending existing functionalities to the wearable, to the body. So it's increased proximity, everything that's closer to the body, but at the same time we also found a reduction of practices because it's an even smaller app than the app for your phone. Um, we found interesting things, such as motivational quotes, dating advice, but also um, uh, moving around maps and uh, um, navigating public transportation. But it also up opens up new sensing practices that are especially based on monitoring heart rate because those were the most apps that we found. And we found very few apps that actually make use of the sleep log API. So there's new, no new innovative management of sleeping, for example, because most are operating actually in health, sports and lifestyle. So now, major conclusions that we can draw from this project is um, that we can use the App Store to study global practices, but we also find, find gendered and country-specific practices. And that App Store can be used to display the political economy of apps in action, for example, in relation to prohibited trade practices, like US-based US apps that we can actually find in the Iranian App Store despite being this trade barrier. And that the wearable app ecosystem is a nested app ecosystem with a very layered infrastructure that seems to be even more closed than iOS and Android. And returning to the theme of this winter school, this new infrastructural layeredness poses new methodological challenges for data collection. Thank you.